Uh, so good morning. And so we are jumping the gun on the slides. With great power comes great responsibility. Okay, so uh, if you go back and listen to the sermons uh, on Daniel chapter 1 and 2, uh, you'll know that it's hard to risk. It's hard to risk everything that we have to trust God. Um, chapter 1 uh, shows us that uh, Daniel and his friends were challenged uh, to give up their Jewish identity uh, by living and eating like the Babylonians do. Um, the king ordered them to be meat eaters, and they said they would prefer to be vegetarians. Um, and feel free to choose your side accordingly. Um, but God is faithful to them, and they choose to not compromise. It's hard to trust God, especially when you're feeling pressured and foolish and weak and helpless. It's hard. It's hard to follow God. Um, and now uh, we're going to discuss how to trust God when we are surrounded by flames. So we get a little um, more intense metaphors going here. So um, this is uh, Daniel chapter 3, starting at verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Last week, um, uh, Eric was talking about uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream about a big statue, and it was made out of all sorts of different materials as if to represent um, different kind of dynasties, different superpowers of the world. And uh, uh, King Neb, I'm just going to call him King Neb because it's way too hard to say that over and over. So King Neb um, puts up this giant statue of gold. Um, it's all gold, or maybe it's wood covered in gold. That's, that's my hunch. This is not all gold. But the idea is that it's one material, and it's, it's really meant to represent Babylon forever. Uh, viva la Babylon. Um, meant to represent the uh, King Neb's anticipation that Babylon uh, is going to be the world superpower forever. Uh, he then summoned the satraps, uh, which I had to look up. It's a Persian word meaning the protector of the realm or a special type of government official. Prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So they all assembled for the dedication of the image that King Neb had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and people of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Neb had set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the orchestra, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Neb had set up. So obviously, this is a test of allegiance across the nation's leadership to see where they, uh, where they are invested, whether it's their own God or uh, the king. And this was uh, set to test people of their uh, religious affiliation and also of their uh, diplomatic affiliation. So uh, if you don't bow, it is a religious rebellion and treason. Uh, pressing on. Um, at this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Neb, and we'll skip ahead just a little bit, there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you had set up. Furious with rage, King Neb summoned Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Neb said to them, Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I had set up? Now when you hear the music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what god will be able to rescue you from my hand? So it's one thing to make a stand for God. It's another thing, and greater thing, to stick to your guns when standing in the face of conflict, death even. Um, yet the king gave these men a chance to change their minds. 
And spoiler alert, they didn't. They won't. They don't. Uh, If you jump ahead to the New Testament uh, in Luke chapter 22, uh, you'll recall the story of Peter who is given a chance uh, to stick to his guns and uh, declare his allegiance to Jesus, and he failed. He failed three times. Um, He caved. Um, And as you read that story, you'll learn that um, he does identify himself as a follower of Jesus. Uh, But right away, uh, these men don't. They don't cave. Uh, So quick story. When I was growing up, my my family was really into grilling, uh, mostly because my sister and I complained about my mother's cooking so much that it drove my father into becoming our dedicated grill master. I'm, I'm sure there's a whole sermon series on gratitude uh, that I need to brush up on, or even on not biting the hand that feeds you. Um, but I just, I guess, I guess I wish I was a little bit more grateful because then this story wouldn't have happened. Um, one day before my dad came home from work, my mother and I thought it would be nice to surprise my dad and light the grill for him. Now, <clears throat> we, we weren't grill experts, um, but can anybody tell me the first rule of lighting a propane grill? What? Heard it back there. Turn the propane on. Okay, the, uh, next, the next rule. All right, let's walk, walk me through how to light a propane grill. Nobody? Turn on the gas and quickly light it. Okay, there's a step in between those two steps. Okay, wow, I didn't know, I didn't know, okay. Not only am I an expert in improv, I am an expert in grilling. So, open the lid, open the lid. Now, what happens if you leave the lid closed, turn on the gas, and then light it? The gas accumulates, and it goes boom. So, as a six-year-old boy, my mother and I made a large explosive fireball in our backyard. (laughs) I remember closing my eyes, but still seeing the orange flames, the flash through my eyelids. I remember smelling my mother's burnt eyebrows. And I remember crying. This was as close as I've ever come to being sent through a blazing furnace. Great. It was great. You could taste the love. Uh, So perhaps God spared me from being just more than emotionally impacted by this experience, but my first response was to cry and to reach out for comfort. I needed to be cared for in that moment. Uh, I experienced a stressful event. Uh, luckily, Luckily, my mother was there to support me. She didn't get blown up by our backyard little science experiment. But it's a normal reaction to reach out for support when surrounded by fire. It's normal to develop behaviors in our minds according to our circumstances. It's normal to cry out. It's even normal to demand comfort. Uh, For those of you who have kids, you know what that's like. Um, But it seems like this story so far is about knowingly walking into fire and putting aside the typical responses to reach out for the world's help. So we're often presented with cues in life uh, or an event, and they lead us to responses. Uh, They lead us to routines. They lead us to habits. And and these habits have rewards with them. Uh, So for instance, uh, giant fireball from the propane death trap, that's the cue. The response is to cry and to reach out, and the reward is to be comforted by my mother in that, uh, in that event. So these are basic behaviors we develop from childhood, right? In fact, the, war- the reward can be so good that we even create cues in our lives to generate predictable rewards. I never uh, tried to blow up the grill intentionally, but I knew what it would result in. It would result in my mother coming out and giving me some sort of attention, um, Probably negative attention, but still attention nonetheless. So for those of you, again, who have kids or were a kid or know a kid, you can see that um, they can develop their own cues to get their own rewards. 
Um, but then we have uh, different cues as we age. Uh, okay, too, too soon. Uh, so maybe our cue is stress. And our response is nicotine or alcohol. And our habit becomes chain smoking or binge drinking. Maybe our cue is weariness. Uh, and our response is to have a Netflix bender. And our habits are wasting our precious sleep time or rest time or relational time. Maybe we're lonely, so we respond by generating a questionable browser history or pursuing dating apps and then solidifying an addiction to arousal and hollow affirmation. So this uh, just becomes a big cycle, and it leads us into addiction. Now consider the cues of... Uh, Daniel's homies, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and consider the environment. In front of them stand a king uh, who has been known uh, to be violent, uh, so violent that he has a whole fiery furnace ready uh, for executions. Um, the peers, the furnace, of course, the competitors, the music from a loud orchestra, all of this is conspiring to... Uh, convince these men to compromise their beliefs. All of it intended to get them to sell out their God. So the men replied to him, King Neb, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. So my paraphrase is, we are obviously guilty of this crime according to your law. If we are thrown into the blazing fire, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So, so what's remarkable here is that these men have a good understanding and a deep appreciation for submission to God. They knew God's power, but they also knew that they must do what's right, even if God did not do what they expected or what they hoped. So what's important here is not having unbreakable confidence in God's ability to bring forth exactly what we want, uh, but rather appreciating submission to a powerful and capable God. So the invitation here is to trade in our idols. Trade in our idols. Uh, so Job chapter 13 says, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Uh, it's good to recognize that God's plan may be different from your desires. So, so what is our response when we make our desires known to God and they are not fulfilled? Let me see if I got chapter 19 on here. Not, not yet. Okay. Uh, I'll just try to re read really fast. So then Neb was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. So uh, these men were, uh, were a pretty high-ranking leaders appointed by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, but now... Uh, he's essentially saying, you're dead to me. You didn't bow in front of this giant gold statue. Um, prepare to burn. He ordered the furnace he did seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie them up and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. So no delay, no preparation. They cranked it up to seven, and they got thrown in. Um, so our three uh, fire buddies have something significant to teach us about this. They've determined um, in, their, um, in, in advance that the cue is worship. They are called into worship uh, this big idol. Uh, but their routine is to worship their God and no other. I bet if we as Christians or we as curious people, um, if we think about it, there are other gods we can list uh, of who we worship. Uh, their faith has become so entrenched in them that they don't seem to wrestle with it at all. They say, uh, King Neb said, bow. They said, no, we'll take whatever consequence comes with it. They're all in. Uh, they, don't, they don't think about turning back, even at the cost of their lives. Uh, so speaking personally, I, I often allow my sin to dominate my life. Um, I constantly seek affirmation from people. Uh, I disarm people with my humor so they won't see my brokenness. 
behind uh, my funny, my funny uh, side, or I'll make you too intimidated to cut through my thick exterior. And my reward is that I often get that inf- that affirmation. I, I get people telling me how how funny I am, how great I am, um, until it isn't, until uh, somebody challenges it, and then I move on to my uh, my second strength, which is contempt. Uh, I, I will uh, try to shut people down from seeing that. Um, and it's because I have chosen to bow at this idol of I'm going to get I'm going to get my affirmation from somewhere else. And so I, I confess, I confess to you guys that this identity searching, it's a big, it's a big statue and it's not of God. And I want to repent of that. I want to turn away um, from that. And this story reminds me to trade in that idol. So what's the reward? What's the reward for these three guys? It's an important question, I think, because the reality is is that we're built for rewards. Uh, You run for rewards, or you sit and you eat ice cream for rewards. You get an education for a reward. You do your job with excellence for a reward. You charm with wit and comedy for a reward. We do what we do, including follow Jesus, or keeping Jesus at a distance in order to receive a reward. It's normal to want a reward from our behaviors. But the rewards of following Jesus are the same as these three men enjoy. And they are confidence, courage, peace, freedom, and power. And these are all promised to us in scriptures as fruits of faithfully looking to Jesus as our source. And if you want to look those up, you can. I'll have them all listed at the end. So remember back in chapter 1 of Daniel when the men trust God by changing their diets? Sure, it's, it's a big deal to give up corn dogs and smash burgers and bacon bits, but it's not, and I don't think bacon bits is actually meat, but I thought it was cute. It's not nearly as big as accepting uh, death for who and how you worship. Many of us are waiting for something big to test our faith before we really start to obey God. And some of us fill our lives with small compromises, just a little alcohol, just a peek on restricted websites, just one more episode or season of television. I I don't want to wait to have a nervous breakdown to understand that I'm called to worship the God of love and grace and hope. Uh, And these men are showing us that obedience to God in small things, like their diets, matters as much as it does in big things, like their lives. So it's time to trade in our idols. Today's idols are not really big statues. They're more seductive. Uh, and this is, this is the one big takeaway, if you, if you don't remember anything else. It's this. Our idols are anything we look to in our lives as our source for comfort, meaning, direction, security, or significance. Our idols are anything we look to in our lives as our source for comfort, meaning, direction, security, and significance. Our idols, then, are our routine responses in the Q routine reward loop that we look uh, look forward to as our primary means of coping when a particular state of mind and heart comes up. When I'm lonely, I check Facebook, or I check Twitter, or I check Tinder, When I'm stressed, I drink. When I'm frustrated, I get angry and I blame and I hold my family and my friends in contempt. When I'm exposed and I'm vulnerable, I shame. Especially to the extent that any unhealthy response to a cue becomes a habit, we become enslaved. We become enslaved to this behavior. And that is what I would call idolatry. Where we're just so used to bowing at that big gold statue that that just becomes who we are. And I can think of long seasons of my life where I was clearly a jerk. And I, that's not who I want to be. And I, wanna choo- I don't want to choose contempt. So idols overpromise and they underdeliver. When I felt great about myself as a jerk, I, I pushed my friends away. And that's not who I want. So in contrast, whenever I choose cues that contribute to my fundamental identity as a child of God or even to my calling, the rewards of confidence and courage, peace, power, and freedom are ignited. And I'm strengthened to walk through fires 
Uh, it's probably a metaphor. I don't encourage you to go out and try to make your grill blow up to test God. Um, but if you really are called to walk through fire, then I really do believe that, uh, that God will be right there by your side. Uh, so really quick, uh, working the uh, rest of the way through. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. So to paraphrase, the king was amazed and said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. He called to the men, servants of the most high God, come out, come here. So they came out of the fire and the crowd came around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched and there was no smell of fire on them. Then King Neb said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except for their own god and their houses. Uh, oops. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against this god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted them in the province of Babylon. So obviously King Neb knows violence. He's well equipped to uh, threaten. Uh, but what he's saying here is this gold statue will not serve the people. The king will not serve the people. Only God will serve the people. Um, so if you, uh, if you think through the story and you do the math, six people went in. Three of them died, and four of them came out. So I know some of you are, are good at math. Keith already figured it out, I could tell. So uh, the three men came out. The soldiers that escorted them in did not make it out. They died in the furnace. And Jesus came out with them. That is my theory. Um, uh, King Neb said that it looked like a son of the gods. So uh, I think whether the men knew it or not, Jesus was with them in the fire, and he walked out with them. He escorted them out. And, you know, humans can create our, our own furnaces. Satan can prepare his own furnace. Uh, but there, there's a better place to be, and try to stick with me here, and it is God's furnace. God's furnace is the place where you're not alone, where your ropes, the, the bindings, are burned off of you, and you are delivered. You are delivered from that death. But sometimes, of course, the situation will be painful. And, and, and these men may not have been burned and have felt the pain of that, but uh, they were being watched by this huge crowd. They were being mocked and shamed and ridiculed and tested. So I'm sure they felt some pain uh, in their hearts, some pain in their spirit. John uh, chapter 16 uh, Jesus says, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And Psalm 34 says, a righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. So God's story is not one where there are no flames. It's not one where there are no problems. But God's story is about resurrection and it's about rising from the flames. But we will have troubles. So practical application. So consider an unhealthy cue and consider its unhealthy response and consider its unhealthy reward pattern in your life. And try to change the response and the reward. And it's easy for me to just say try to change because I've been trying to change for a long time and, and I'm really struggling. Um, so trying to change um, involves two things. One is to ask for help. It's to say, hey, Corey, I have a sin in my life, and I don't know how to get through it, and I need your help. Or come to uh, a pilgrim group, which is uh, our small uh, Bible studies, and say, will you all pray for me? Will you help me through this? So that's one way, is to get the community involved. Um, the other way is to pray, is to say, God, I've been struggling with being a jerk my whole life. 
And I continue to choose that over my wife and my kids. And it is not productive and it is not healthy and it is tearing me up. God, will you help me? So do you believe that, that over time, at least, the right response will lead to the rewards of confidence, courage, peace, power, and freedom? I think so. I think that it, it, it can lead to that. I certainly feel like less of a jerk, but still I feel like those um, rise up in me, and I, at any moment I'm willing to, to offer, offer shame and contempt. And that's no good. Um, so then determine the, the righteous response to that cue, the response of, of faithfulness that will bring that reward. So when I'm lonely, instead of whatever, checking Facebook, um, and I'm not condemning Facebook, I think Facebook serves a great purpose. Um, but when I'm lonely, I will call a friend and I, uh, to encourage me or to, uh, to encourage them, or maybe both. I will declare that Jesus is right here with me, even though I'm struggling. When I'm stressed, I will exercise or I will give thanks for my body. I will choose not to body shame myself or to compare myself to others. I will offer my tension and my sadness and anger to Jesus. When I'm frustrated with my family or my coworkers, I will pray for wisdom and strength to be a person of peace and grace and truth. When I'm exposed and vulnerable, I will remember that God says, Corey, I love you and with you I am well pleased. Jesus delights in knowing us. He delights in knowing me and he blesses my exposure and my vulnerability. So you get the picture. Changing our habits of response to life's cues is what Christ followers call discipleship. Discipleship is trading in our idols. Uh, it, it helps me to understand uh, the mysterious absence of Daniel. I don't know if you, any of you are wondering where uh, uh, Mr. Daniel went. Um, and so I'm going to plop down some quick metaphors and, and feel free to argue with me about these if you want. But I, I think that King Neb is kind of like Satan in that he tricks the community and he tricks the world into idolatry. He says, bow to this gold statue and you will have your life. You will have life full life. And that is an empty promise because it underdelivers, because he, the people are in, in bondage to, to the hierarchy, to, to, uh, to, to King Neb. The furnace represents our life's tribulations. Uh, whatever you're dealing with now, that's, that's your own furnace. And if you don't feel like you're in a furnace right now, wonderful. I, I'd love to celebrate that with you. The, the Hebrew men are you and me and Israel preserved through the tribulations. The executioners are those who are in line with uh, the enemy's plans to take us down. And Daniel is like the church. Um, That's my argument. He's a strong force in the world, not yet established. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, Daniel didn't bow to the to the statue. I'm pretty sure that Daniel was likely on some sort of assignment from Nebuchadnezzar, and and that's why he is not included here in this story. So the challenge is here. It's uh, if you jump ahead to to Paul's letter, uh, letter to the Romans, chapter 12, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is, the, what is good and acceptable and per, the perfect will of God. So what are the, tra- the idols that God is inviting you to trade in? I invite you to challenge me to trade in my idols and that you would welcome me, you would welcome me to challenge you. Community, these people right here, even if this is your first time, This is a group dedicated to living like Jesus, to living well, and to living alive. Not just living to not be killed by our our king, King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, We can build each other up as, as we develop habits that aim us back towards God and gain rewards that are about life and living and not death. Our reward on this side of heaven is confidence and courage and peace 
and freedom and power. It's time to trade in our idols. Uh, so those are the references there for those of you who like to, to jot down notes. Um, I don't know how much time I have for questions. It's 11.15. Maybe like three questions. Two minutes for questions. Okay. Then we have a question. Push back. Over the top affirmation to uh, all my hard work. Um, so uh, one thing is, I think I relate to King Nebuchadnezzar where these other guys come along and instead of just saying, well, they're like, they're not cooperating. They cut straight to like, these guys don't value you. They don't listen to anything you say. Right. And just, uh, so I think um, it's interesting to me to look for who's coming along or what's coming along in that cycle and telling me that it's, that it's different than, than what it is, hmm. that, 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 what's going on is, is more crucial or like, I really need this. Hmm. Um, but I am curious. So like, what's the difference? You, you kind of described idols as being something that you go to through for comfort and, and all those things. So, I mean, if I ever eat a cookie, I know it's going to taste good and it'll be kind of comforting, but I don't think every time I do that, that I'm, that it's idolatry necessarily, but it can be what, what would you say is the distinguishing? Yeah, so I, I would say the... Ooh, do you have a response? Oh, okay. <laughs> I would say um, eat a cookie. I, I would say that God has given us cookies to enjoy and to take delight in that. And God gave you that cookie. And so if... If there is a godless experience of the goodness of that cookie, then yeah, it can become an idol. And then it's, I'm stressed out. I don't know how to process this. I'm just going to pound through a whole pack of Oreos. And that's different from saying like, wow, like I have this delicious cookie that God gave me. Like God, God put the ingredients together or whatever. He, he gave me resources to access it. So, so no, I don't think that indulging or to take delight in simple things, or even really big things, uh, like even like a relational um, connection. I think that that's really, really good. And I, and I think that there are certainly good things to even um, having money or having other material possessions and, and appreciating them. But as long as uh, there's a foundation of God in that, um, that, that's the difference, I think, between idolatry and really accepting a good thing. Yeah, right here. And then we'll do one more question. I just was wondering, uh, the statue was 60 cubits by 6 cubits. I was just wondering, like, how long is a cubit? How big is this statue? Sure. So a cubit is uh, the distance between your elbow and your fingertip. So it's about... Um, yeah, so foot and a half. So 60 times one and a half. I get all math wizards out the there. NI, the NIV says 90 feet high and nine, nine feet wide. So there you go. Cube is about a foot and a half. Okay, last question, Danielle. Um, so, so many of our Q response reward cycles are <clears throat> kind of like, you don't think about it. It just happens, you know? Right. And so many addictive cycles are just, it just happens. And you're kind of like, afterwards, you're like, oh, crap. But So, I don't know. I guess I'm just wondering if there's something, or you can talk about a little bit, what, um, what you can do to kind of, like, help be conscious in the moment or, or yeah. like, stop the cycle as it's happening instead of just ba afterward saying, you know, oh, crap. Sure. Well, sometimes it's impossible to break a habit before we know that it's a habit. It, only until we experience the symptoms of that behavior do we realize that it's really not a good behavior. Um, so maybe once you're done with the whole pack of Oreos and you're like, 
I don't think that was such a good idea. Maybe there was some idol worshiping happening in that uh, experience of Oreo, Oreo binger, uh, binger, bender, bender. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, and so I think that it, it, it it's the, a good first step to just say, self, what are some unhealthy habits and behaviors I'm involved in? And a second step would be to say to your spouse or to a friend that really knows you, have you noticed anything in me that, you know, seems to be uh, kind of an empty promise under delivering habit? Uh, because I'll tell you what, I think the, the mark of a good spouse, the mark of a, of a good friend is to say, uh, honey or pal, um, you know, I, I kind of want to bring something to the light and, um, and pray for you in this kind of sin pattern. I've been noticing a lot of empty Oreo containers around. I'm wondering if that is doing something for you that really you're looking for God to do in you. Um, so, so yeah, take an inventory and, and ask around. Yeah. And, and I just, this is the tip of the iceberg for me. I have a long list of bad habits. Um, yeah. Bring us home, Kevin. That's one. Can you use the mic for the recording, please? Don't know where it went. Oh, it's right here. It's been put away. I did. And I made an exception. Um, I would just respond quickly to your question saying that something that's helpful to me is to slow down and slow everything down. Because like you said, that cue response reward happens in milliseconds. But I don't know, being mindful of what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're saying, and just taking time to let your actions really be be labored oftentimes helps me to enter in and actually be conscious of what's happening. That may be obvious, but that's my thought. I think, I think actually talking through it, like through different experiences, especially afterwards, um, like we do in Pilgrim group and, uh, is what helps slow down those moments and recognize earlier in the cycle that something's happening. Yeah. Um, thank you for your feedback. Let's, uh, let's pray. Uh, God, thank you. Thank you for giving us your word and thank you for giving us each other, uh, to speak, uh, more to the goodness that you have to offer us. And, um, God, I pray that what has been said and how things have been said, um, would not impact us as much as your voice, God, that you would be the truth speaker to us. Uh, that wouldn't, we wouldn't get tripped up in um, the hows, uh, but rather we would just see uh, the goodness uh, of your word uh, and bless us as we uh, move forward in community. And we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.